First of all, um, Zach, thank you so much for that. You know, um, I, I really don't know how many of you um, realize how, how much sophisticated information Zach has just shared with us. Because now we are at MDR, where I, like I mentioned to you before, I do believe we haven't even crossed the CRS so like uh, mystery. Um, on that note, because I, I, Zach wouldn't do it, so I'm going to do that, right? Uh, can I have a show of hands of those who take durian? 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 Come on, guys. It's a cold room. We can react. We see quite a lot of durian eaters, right? Super. Um, how many of you know CRS? Honestly, hands to heart, understand what CRS Hands to heart. Hand, hands up. Oh, no more durian for the rest. <laughs> see what I mean? Okay. Um, but... But honestly, um, not knowing CRS true and true as well, but grasping a little bit of it, I must say this MDR, uh, pardon my French, scares me. Absolutely, yeah, this is really something that's worth um, considering. Oh, oh, what has this done? Okay, go. Um, so, Zach, thank you very much for that. I, I think, Zach, I want to share a little bit about uh, something that we, is happening in Malaysia. In fact, involving the Malaysian bar on in July of last year, as we all should know, um, Malaysian Bar took LHDN to court uh, because they wanted us to uh, open up our clients' account um, books and everything. So Malaysian Bar is saying, all the lawyers that were saying that, no, that's legal professional privilege, our clients' account. I'm pleased to tell you that on the 2nd of April of this year, we won. Yeah, yeah we got a bit of cost, that's about it. But I'm just wondering now what you just mentioned about MDR. Now, I'm a bit confused. Um, uh, I, does, that, does that mean you think, with, and how does that work? I mean, basically, in this particular case, LHDN told us that we should open our, they want to have a look at our clients' book for few law firms. So the bar kind of came behind this law firms and said, no, don't do that. This is not right. Yeah, so MDR is trying to, to, to again affect the law. Yeah, so... Right, so when Malaysia signs up, obviously it's about signing up again, you have to yeah, sign up to it. Absolutely, yeah. So that, that's a worry. I mean, that's all really relevant worries. Thank you for that. I mean, that's... Okay, Zach's really, um, like I said, um, it's always amazing when you have a speaker that comes in and they have an international perspective. And I'm, I'm still learning and I'm, I'm making a point to go all to conferences so that I get an international perspective. But um, bringing down many, many notches, okay, we're going to get a bit local now. Now, um, in this room, um, again, I'm so at home here because this is the Malaysian bar. I mean, it's our building. And uh, fellow Hello lawyers, I think there's quite a lot of you. Can I have a show of hands, please? Fellow lawyers, great, okay. And all the rest will be from related fields as well. So um, now, we are in a new age, definitely. And um, anything and everything can happen. Some good, yay, Malaysia, and some not so good. Uh, but I do not want some too much like a girl guy, but I'm for Lady Baden-Powell. I think we should be prepared. Uh, if you're in this room today and this topic, you came for it, I think there should be some kind of interest about estate planning, somewhat not being just a lawyer, some of your fields would be related to estate planning, yes? So what is estate planning? Um, as defined by the irrefutable source of wisdom, Wikipedia. Where is it? Uh-uh. Ah. Estate planning is the process of anticipating and arranging during the person's life for the disposal of their estate. Estate planning can be used to eliminate uncertainties and to maximize the value by reducing taxes and expenses. Ultimate goal of estate planning, well, it depends on whether you want to go as simple or complex. It depends on the client. Now, the takeaway words here are anticipate and arrange. Simply be in control of a scenario before the worst happens. Now, I'm going to illustrate what I mean by that. Jack arrived alive and retired at 54. Now, um, we're going to be a bit proactive here. You guys are all sitting down. The room is really cold. Um, I have little, little things to give out to you all. Uh, Jack. Who's Jack? Anybody know the Jack I'm referring to here? Come on, guys. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Come on. From? Hands up, sorry. Ali, from? from Alibaba. Very good, sweetie. Come on up here and get your gift. Come on, come, 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 come. There is. You're yeah, very good. Yeah. What's your name? Oh, see, you get autographs. I'm a dear Joanne. Ah, oh, there, Joanne. Go on. You can sit down. Very good. That's Jack Ma from Alibaba. Um, I was uh, flying here today, and I know I read a little bit more about him today and his um, uh, successor. 
Alibaba started in 1999 when I started my firm. But he has a market cap of 427 billion already. All right? So I go to the market with a cap. Okay, that's about it. I mean, but wow. Uh, Jack Ma. All right. And then we have Wang Jian. Wang Jian. Anyone know his story? Oh, really? Who, who said, yeah? You're going to get a gift. You know this. Who said, yeah? Okay, what happened to Wang Jian? Yeah, not smart, right? Okay, he's got money too. But he went on a holiday to Provence Valley in France, as rich people do. And then I think he wanted a selfie like everybody does. So he pushed himself out on a parapet wall. But people push themselves up and take the photo, not push themselves up and fall over. And that's what he did. He died. So, Jack and Jian. Um, sir, come on, get your gift, please. Uh, uh, you guys are so boring and sitting there, okay? You guys have to show... Uh, what's your name? Oh, oh, dear Gun. Okay. I'm trying to show Zach that we're actually quite alive as well. All right, fine. So, yeah, absolutely. Don't worry about me, Jack. Don't worry about Zach. Um, Jack and Jen, um, they were both successful people, but you know what I'm trying to illustrate here? Even if you have money, things happen. And the point is to plan. Um, the other words we were looking at was disposal or rather dealings with the residue or one's estate. It goes back to the innate characteristic of a person, of a successful person. There's a pension to control and a pension to preserve. People think rich people tend to be a spendthrift, but the truth is the richer they get, the more thrifty they are. Warren Buffett, I like Warren Buffett. He says, the difference between successful people and really successful people is that the really successful people say no to almost everything. Now this chap, well, he's only worth about USD 88.3 billion, you know, no big deal. But he still drives his old Cadillac XTS. I, I think we know that. And it's worth about US 45,000. That's about 200,000 um, uh, ringgit, Malaysian ringgit. So uh, think about that. You know, he's only 88.3 billion. So all you Beamers, Mercs, and Maybachs drivers, uh, you go hide your cars. You know who I'm talking about. <laughs> But it's not only Mr. Buffett um, who has worked hard and accumulated. All of us who do that, we, we feel the need to take care of the little pile we've actually worked hard to, to bring together. We want to dictate as much as possible and possibly even beyond the grave. So we are back to planning. I'm, gonna, um, the, I'm moving up on this idea. I'm going to bring you up to foundations, but I thought as fellow practitioners, and this was the route which I took as a I'm just a legal practitioner like the rest of you, but how do we move on in practice and how we move up this uh, sort of like the ladder of structuring? This is very basic kindergarten for Zach, so Zach, enjoy the videos, okay? So we are back to planning to eliminate uncertainties and maximize value at the estate by reducing taxes and expenses, uh, all related to CRS and MDR as well. Now, onshore, we're going to go basic first. Onshore, many of us know here that to drop a will is a basic entry level of planning. But by doing so, very least, you have chosen a dictator for, let's look what a will does. It can name a person who is to be entrusted, the executor. It will list the assets concerned eventually to the estate's assets. It will express clearly the beneficiaries uh, that you want to receive and what proportions. And you can dictate conditions that they have to satisfy before they can inherit. Now, whilst knowing that making a will is good, Procrastination sometimes gets the better of us. And I'm mentioning this part because I know that many of you who are um, practitioners and planners would always ensure at minimum there is a structure. But the truth of the matter, sometimes we take too long to get to it. So intestacy issues in Malaysia is still very much prevalent. So let's just look a little bit about what happens when you do pass away without having a chance to at least just make a will. So you have passed away intested. If you do, then you will have no control whatsoever as to who will handle this at his estate, uh, who will become administrators. Sometimes the people that will become administrators aren't even the ones that the, the sedent would have chosen. How irritating, right, from beyond the grave if somebody was handling your stuff and you don't even like them? Mm. The assets which would correctly be deemed as state assets, you would even know what they do with your things and who are to benefit. Now, um... Be careful of the, who is to benefit, because intestacy rules of different countries apply. Um, 
you have to look at where you pass the nature of the assets, is it movable or immovable, and the domicile of the deceased will as well, okay? Um, and then obviously there are those who can claim, um, those who will try their luck when you're in, st in testacy. I mean, the, you're not even really related, but you feel you can try your luck to get something. Um, there was a 2017 Australian case, and it's just amazing, where in the stepchild of an ex Domestic, for, uh, a domestic former partner of the deceased managed to still lay a big claim to the will just to say that because I stayed over at you know who's and whose house for a couple of days I mean it goes so far and um, then obviously the general public must also be informed that the two tier prong of getting a grant of letters of administration as opposed to a grant of probate is far costlier and hassly Okay, but what we have determined is that to do a will is definitely more prudent than not having a will. A will is prudent, but it is not a conscious form of relinquishing. We, you know, um, I think the whole fixation here now and I've sort of rather the focus is to help our clients plan something out and not about the consequence when they just leave. You want them to be able to help them plan something and let them see the plan in motion. A will will not allow that because obviously a will comes into effect when you are dead, obviously. Um, the executor's duty is primarily to distribute. And today, um, the subject matter is HNWI. We are looking at that kind of wealth that should be preserved. It's not just enough to last for the next generation. We're looking at more. And with affluence, we are no longer talking about assets in one country. Assets will be all over the world, so we have to consider cross-border assets and sometimes, of course, the language of whether there's one will or more. Um, similarly to investing, HNWIs, which we're going to talk about later, are also known to send their children abroad to study. And when you send them to study abroad for so long and they enjoy the life there, they decide to become citizens of their country. So then your children become foreign beneficiaries, ironically. Now, all these points, which makes for more complex considerations, is when sometimes you have to look at the individual you are um, advising and just realize that maybe a will is too simple and not good enough. And obviously, any will can be contested. It depends on the tenaciousness of the applicant, um, and I love using this case of Ugat Clark. Um, Zach, you know this one? This, this, you don't know it. Oh gosh, there's story time. Anybody knows the case of Ugat Clark? You can get presents. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 no. Okay. So this Ugat Clark, I use her as an example because um, typically America, they have sensationalized everything. Her life is now um, a subject of a movie called Empty Mansions, The Mysterious Life of Ugat Clark the spending of a great American fortune. Okay, I also use her because her, name's, her, na her name is pronounced Ugit. To me, it sounds like who gets, all right? Okay, uh, wrong number. Okay, so Ugit, she was the surviving daughter of William A. Clark, which was a U.S. senator and industrialist of copper mining fortune. She left two wills, and you imagine the latest one will always be one that prevails. But the trouble is that, and that was, she, that was made six years before she passed. But at that point, she was eight, 98 years of age. But this two very different set of wills was going to benefit two different, very different set of beneficiaries. The former, the earlier will, would have enriched 21 distant relatives whom she didn't even know. Whereas the, the most current one was going to give monies to a sole caregiver. I think it was a Filipino uh, caregiver, uh, a foundation for the arts, and even an art gallery stood to inherit, and it included things like the Monet's water lilies, okay, good stuff. Now, in September of 2013, this dueling wills case was settled, and the distant relatives won. People she didn't even know, oh, and it was up to US 34 million and then some. I would call this a wheel of fortune. So you see, when you do wills, Anything can happen, especially when you, especially when you don't even throw out the, the, the will that you didn't mean before. So be very careful of this. It will be more appropriate now to explain what heightened problems one has when one is richer. You see the shaking woman? Yeah. Okay. 
And this is important. Uh, now, high net worth, as you can read, and it's okay, it's those who hold financial assets excluding their primary residence with a value greater than one million. Um, this, I was reading uh, Zach's slides just now, and you notice that if the sum did not exceed USD one million, then it's unreportable. Obviously, if you have like 999,999, then you're fine with vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, but then you won't be able to be called a HNW. Now, you know, I can see the subtle knots in the crowd. They, they read the definition of HNW and they go, ah, oh, so I'm, ah, oh yeah, I'm one. You see, you, you can see that, yeah? It's, it's, I mean, but truly, it's really quite simple. The more you have, the more you have to plan. So for today's masterclass, I would like to give a particular shout out to the organizers as well, LIBSC and the Malaysian Bar. I believe this is under CPD. Um, you know, bringing Zach here today and uh, inviting myself, uh, I can't impress upon yourselves how important it is to look into wealth planning um, in a deeper aspect. If you want to like foray into this field of estate succession planning, and the beauty of this is the ginormous amount of wealth in this region. That's why Zach came, came to this region. Excellent. And after all, the success of crazy rich Asians. Now, this is a depiction of real Asia nowadays. Otherwise, they wouldn't write a book. And then, you know, we have them to deal with. And then we have crazy rich girlfriend issues to deal with. And then we have rich people's problems. I mean, my goodness, the amount of work that we can do, you have no idea. And admit it, when Zach first said CRS, and since you all really do not know what the word is, only one hand went up, they thought it was crazy rich Singaporeans. <laughs> and I know you know some of those, right? I know, yeah. Now back to structuring. Okay, enough of the waker upper. Um, a step up from the will would be, when one, one starts to give more in-depth thoughts to how you could plan, then and one might turn to a trust, and that's quite normal. A trust requires certainty of intention by the settlor, and you have to settle in favour of a named trustee. You need certainty of subject matters, the assets, which are to be transferred to the trustee to constitute a complete and valid trust. If you don't transfer the assets, then you'll be incompletely constituted, not a proper trust. And then you need certainty of objects, the beneficiaries. And mind you, of course, notwithstanding having yet received, as soon as you name them, they have beneficial ownership. Now, if a trust is what you think might be the right fit for a client, then in this case, let me, let's make a quick comparison of a trust onshore and offshore. After reading the MDR again, I need to qualify that whatever I'm speaking about here is not a CRS avoidance arrangement, nor is it an off, opaque offshore structure. I wouldn't know how to draft that yet. Okay, all right. Um, so we're comparing a trust onshore and offshore. And it's not moving. People, stop. Oh, okay. I have to press. All right. Okay, press helps. Now, I think this is quite, I don't know if you can see it. Is it clear enough for everyone? Sort of, come on, squint. All right. Um, okay. Well, you know, onshore, we are looking at, I'm using, obviously, at the behest of LIBFC, I have to sp speak about Labuan being the offshore. So onshore is Peninsula Malaysia. Labuan is the offshore entity I'm comparing with. Now, did you do you all know where Labuan is? Hands up. Hands up. Mm. Uh, all right, all right. So, um, and Labuan is part of Malaysia. Oh, gosh. All right, but it is an offshore jurisdiction. That would mean it writes on a different set of statutes entirely. So that's very important. Uh, that would mean I had to inhale all four of the statutes on the side of Labuan before I tried to do any Labuan work, all right? What is important and the elements to be compared with that's very important, um, legal system statutes, they are a factual thing, is a provision of the word protector. Uh, Zach mentioned that as well, and given that you don't know what CRS is, so they were blank on protector as well. So in Malaysian trust law, under the, all the trust acts there, there is no statutory definition, but there is under the Labuan Trust Act. The beauty of the protector is that it gives another player in the common tripartite scenario of a trust, 
as you know, a trust has a settler, a trustee and beneficiary. You will have a protector there, which actually oversees the trustee. And then basically for me, this gives it a double layer of fiduciary and uh, overseeing. Onshore, I suppose we could actually draft languages of a protector in, but as to whether that will hold any water, because there's no any um, law to be, uh, back that, that's another question. So that's a plus for offshore trust. Uh, very, very importantly, if you're a practitioner of uh, trust and uh, in Malaysia fo following the UK normal common law idea, the rules against perpetuity, that totally is an important fact. Now, since there are practitioners in the, rule, uh, in the room, and I don't want to be the only one speaking, rules against perpetuity, does, can anyone mention what it is to me? It's a, it's a mouthful, so nobody wants to read. Rules against perpetuity? Ms. Wong, want to go for it? Okay, okay. She goes, damn. <laughs> okay, but you all know it, so I'm just going to say it to you. Basically, the rules against perpetuity is, a, is telling you that you cannot vest something in too remote a time where, where you tie up capital and everything until the basic idea of the trust is already obliterated. Onshore, they're saying that the rule applies, is based on the lives of the beings of that trust plus 21 years, or 80 years. And this fixed, the letter fixed period you had to denote in the trust. When I say that, does that ring a bell? Trust law? Did we all go to law school? It's coming back. It's coming back. Offshore, the, rule against, the rules against perpetuity does not apply. Now, it doesn't mean that we have just like... Um, I think this is an important point, uh, point in time that I have to mention something about the word offshore. Um, and those who have read the papers in the prior years, um, back before CRS and MDR gets the spotlight, we had the uh, Panama Papers, then the Paradise Papers. And the offshore word be became kind of bad language for a while, right? And Labuan it used to be L, uh, Labuan Offshore Financial Center. Even then, they decided to call it international business. There was so much stigma to the word offshore. But you've got to understand that offshore has proper law. You actually do things properly, it's proper law. Um, I think, and there's a lot of words that you have to sort of like um, uh, clarify again. It is not, uh, what do you call it? It's not anonymity. It's having the right to have privacy. That's important. It is not avoiding. It's planning. So just when you are a um, service provider that helps clients to do offshore work, you go, everyone goes, uh-huh, you know what I mean? And then there's this. No, you can, do the, you can help them do proper work. That's what, that's what I do. Anyway, offshore, uh, all the centers have taken into account what has been the sort of like... Um, the weaker points of onshore law. So the rules against perpetuity does not apply offshore. It must be remembered that the offshore world caters specifically to um, clients who want continuous succession planning. So why would you actually limit the, you know? Um, and then obviously the quantum of assets in play as well. There's a lot of it, and we're looking at it um, to benefit beneficiaries for several generations and not just one. Uh, revocability is a very important one as well. Uh, onshore, when you do a trust, to make it, to have it valid, the whole idea is that once you've already dated your trust document, it is valid. There's no revoking it. Anything else that seems a little bit shoddy brings the trust into invalidity. The offshore world has the language and is provided in the statutes that allows revocation. You can, uh, the status laws can actually revoke the trust if it's not done properly. You can empower another party to revoke and the settler can even reta retain rights. So that's, a, that's a definitely a plus there. And beneficiaries' rights and power. I think this Saunders versus Vautier is like, a, is a paren I mean, it's a historical case. How many, how, how, how many knows this case? Saunders versus Wattier. Oh, gosh. Zach knows. Zach, you're going to get a present. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, basically, in Saunders versus Wattier, it says that if any beneficiaries were absolutely entitled and they work together, they can actually collectively close down the trust. So forget the trustee, just close it down. Um, in the offshore trust scenario, we know that you, have, you want to give to the beneficiaries, they def definitely have beneficial interests, but there are a lot of um, statutory um, provisions 
uh, under Section 22, for example, of the Love One Trust Act, that will exclude a beneficiary from benefits if they were naughty. Uh, the imposition on the beneficiary of certain obligations before they can actually um, benefit. And there's even um, areas and ability to say when you can declare a beneficiary to cease being one. Okay, so all these are forms of curtailing a beneficiary's rights and power. And very, very importantly, confidentiality, disclosure, and secrecy. Um, on onshore, when a trustee steps in that role, the fiduciary duty is really heavy on the trustee, and that's important. Um, but on the offshore statutes, literally, it gives you um, clarity about what and what you can't do. And the Labon Trust, if it was ever caught into play, everything's heard in camera. So yes, a lot of good rules there. I don't want to like focus too much on trust today. Um, I'm just trying to like move it up from the idea of if you were going to do a will and then you want to go a bit deeper, you'll do a trust. I'm going to move up to foundations, yeah? You see, because the perennial problem about trust has about, is always about who will be the trustee. Because this person, the trustee, will wield a lot of power. As you know, the trust is only in order because you have already moved and settled all your assets on the trustee. This person, per the name, has to be trusted, okay, and capable. So basically, when settlers cannot find a trustee, a person that they can trust, a trust structure cannot materialize. So what is the alternative? Here we go. The foundation. Um, frankly, um, before I start, may I have a show of hands as to anyone who's dabbled in foundations? You have, good. Onshore? Oh, sir, you too. Uh, using which jurisdiction? Labuan as well. You're from Labuan. Mm, oh gosh. Okay, uh, you want to take the mic? Okay, fine. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, young lady, and you? Say again? Onshore as well. Is it Labuan or other jurisdictions? Other jurisdictions, like what? Panama, yeah, Panama. So you see, um, foundations are generally a civil law creation. So um, Panama would be one of the older uh, jurisdictions that does uh, foundation law as well. Uh, you come in on a service provider level, sir? All right, okay. Let's get into a little bit of foundation for those who, um, you two special people, you can listen up. Okay, foundation is a civil law product. It offers an alternative solution to the common law trust vehicle. Some high net worth individuals, now you know HNWI, find the trust structure to be unpalatable because of the concept of split legal and beneficial ownership. We know what that means, right? Set law has already um, given it up, settled. The legal owner of the trust asset is the trustee, but the beneficial ownership is the beneficiary so named even if they haven't received, all right? But before I also expound on this piece de resistance of my offering, I want you to know that I'm focusing again on Labuan Foundation because they're the sponsor. It is also timely and I'm delighted to say that the two giants of this region, Singapore and Hong Kong, does not have foundation law. Am I right or am I right, Zach? I'm so happy that sometimes we have things they don't have. Okay. You know, Singapore. So, so hooray for Labuan. But seriously, guys, I mean, um, Labuan has placed itself in a really good scenario because they, in this region, I do believe Labuan is the only one that has foundation laws. Um, when I'm asked to do, when, when I have a Malaysian family or client that ask me to do a found, uh, foundation, they say, don't go to Labuan because it's too near, then generally I've been looking at Guernsey, Jersey, Panama, okay? But Singapore and Hong Kong does not have foundation law. Got to say it again. Okay, with the foundation, it has features of both trusts because it's intended for beneficiaries and companies because the foundation is a legal entity on its own. The trust is not, okay? The trust, if you want to buy something with a trust, as in the name of a trust, correctly, you're buying it in the trustee's name, all right? With a foundation, it's a legal entity. So, um, Alison Wong Foundation can actually buy... She just bought a Beamer, right? Uh, buy her Mercedes or buy a car or buy another house. All right. Sorry, Alison. Um, sit in front. Lah. Um, there is no separation of legal and beneficial ownership. So the foundation is both the legal and beneficial owner. Okay? And very importantly, no beneficiary has any equitable interest in the assets until given. 
There will be a list of beneficiaries and you name the beneficiaries concerned, just like a trust. But trust, remember Saunders versus Vautier? Here, you know that you're the beneficiary. You can't demand until you get given. Lovely. Like a company, the foundation, like I just mentioned, Alison Wong Foundation, can hold and register its name over the asset, and you can even sue. You're literally just like a company that way. Um, then obviously, the founder, can, the founder, which is akin to a testator in a will or a settler in a trust, you can be a Malaysian resident or a non-resident. It can be an individual or body corporate. I've done foundations with um, Malaysian residents, uh, Malaysian non-residents, as well as founders who are body corporates. So obviously it all works. Um, there will be objects and beneficiaries. I mentioned that has no equitable right. You can have a council member or supervisory person. That's optional. The only mandatory requirements is that you need to have a secretary to the foundation and it needs to be a Labuan Trust Company. That's one requirement. And you have to have at least one officer. Okay? And that officer could be an individual or a body corporate as well. So really, um, and I'm comparing this with Guernsey and Jersey, and we really have, Labuan has actually come up with, this, their laws came out in 2010, and it's really... What was the word? Flexible. Because in Guernsey and Jersey, the trust company in Guernsey and Jersey will have to be seemingly involved on a very executive level. Uh, so I've had a lot of families that have been happy with this because they found that they don't really have much intrusion from third parties, save for the fact that you have a secretary for the foundation as a Labuan Trust Company. The only thing I would say, and with due respect to LIBFC and its... Um, a regulator, LFSA, with Labuan Financial Services Authority, is that I think, and the poor LTC, the Labuan Trust Company, I think the onus to ensure that things are right, and then here in the world of CRS and MDR, the LTC in this scenario has a lot of work to do. And I pity them. And uh, is there any Labuan Trust Company people in the room? Oh, there you go. I pity you, okay? Pity. Well, I explain pity. For us lawyers who do this, I'm purely on the side of my client and family. And, you know, I know where I, I'm standing. I'm just creating their foundation, their books and their charter and articles. With the LTC, you have to sit as a secretary. So in a way, your client, they are paying your bill. You'll become the secretary of the foundation. And so you have a sort of an obligation, obviously a commercial obligation with them. But at LTC also sort of is, is in fact, an officer of the LSA. So they will do the primary uh, checks on the family and all. So I do find that the clients love us a little bit more than the LTCs. Sorry. Yeah, you can, you can come in with something else later. Um, so be the beautiful thing about this, and onshore, I think the foundations we hear here is all about a charitable nature. Today we're talking about private client foundation. It's like a foundation you set up for your own family. We don't have it here. Offshore, the private family foundation has rapidly become the go-to vehicle because of the two makeup for the fact that the foundation the retains full control. There's no um, splitting up of legal and beneficial ownership. And the founder can be very much involved on so many levels. Um, it will be next slide. I'm going to show you a sample flowchart of a private family foundation. Okay, this is a sample of uh, when we flow a foundation down, all right? Um, so the founder, as we mentioned, can be an individual or body corporate, it can, and is both the legal and beneficial owner. You have assets, you've um, identified the assets you want to endow, and as a trust, you will settle into the trust. For a foundation, you endow assets into the foundation. Um, like a company, the foundation has charter and articles, the constitutional documents now, as we as per our language. Um, you, have, you can have council members, that's optional. And if you do, then there'll be a letter of appointment by the founder and acceptance by the council member. You have to have a officer. You need to have a secretary. Those two are mandatory in the middle. And of course, the letter of appointments. And then you set up the foundation. The foundation can be revocable or irrevocable. You need to state your purposes for your foundation. And then you will have a list of all the beneficiaries that will benefit under the foundation. 
But of course, very importantly to mention, they do not have a right to demand. They only have a right to receive when get given. Very, very important. The beautiful thing about the fact is that the founder here, imagine you're letting go, you're giving your assets, endowing into the foundation, but you can still involve yourself. The founder can be a council member or an officer, but you cannot be both. And you can name yourself as a beneficiary. So the idea is that I see when, when I'm comparing structures for clients, obviously in a foundation scenario, a founder is, uh, in a foundation scenario, is letting go and not quite, not so quickly, still being involved. So it's back to the basic question sometimes when people ask me, what is better, a trust? Should we trust or find a better foundation? I think the two primary elements that reinforces the efficacy of the foundation is the trusted candidate issue. In a trust scenario, a true and good trustee is hard to find. Um, it's scarce, right? And when you find one, you worry about you know, substitute trustees, individuals, people, the, dip, the hardest commodity to find good people. And in a foundation scenario, although yes, the founder is giving out and endowing, the, founda the founder can still be a council member or officer, so sort of still involved. So the founder involves himself to a great extent and lets the foundation mature, and then he takes off. And of course, beneficiaries and their demands. As we mentioned already, um, a trust, the benef uh, beneficial rights are already formed from the point that the trust is set up. The beneficial ownership is already imprinted. They have a right to demand. And in a foundation, distribution is made to the beneficiaries per the terms of the foundation, and they cannot demand when. But it's most important to address the whale in the room. Now I must say whale. Yes, sir. Sure. Is there a minimum number for council Minimum number of council? No, there isn't. No, there isn't. So yes, of all, yeah. But the same council member cannot be an officer. Yeah, is a is either or. Yeah, can can be one. Yeah. I was just you just uh, interrupted my whale in the room statement. No, no, it's okay because I was going to say that whales are now the more notorious because it used to be elephants in the room, but now whales are important. Come on, people. Oh, so tiring, you know. All this high net worth, they want to plan and structure, but they are not fond of letting go. So a founder in a foundation structure has what I call a having your cake and eating it too scenario. Because the founder gets to plan and structure. You know, uh, the founder gets to lay out the rules, the vision, the mission statements in the charter and the foundation, gets to write his whole book and everything but he still retains some level of control because of all the roles in which he can involve himself in. So in conclusion, I believe that many of us practitioners, are, as well as others in the related field, we have been heavily focused on help, helping clients accumulate, buying, acquiring, taking over. But in this mortal, mortal world, and I think Mam Saputan just erupted, right? It's so upsetting. It is also time to refocus on consolidating and succession planning. And on that note, I'm also a worry ward, and my current two pet worries are the reintroduction of the inheritance tax, the estate duty. There was a hint of it uh, a year or so back. I panicked. And the lack of legal provisions to do with living wills. Alison knows I'm obsessed, and the lasting power of attorney. Obsessed. Um, now, both of these worries, um, inheritance tax, uh, estate duty, if you do a will, guys, and that comes back, think hard, all right? Uh, we, yes, Zach, in Malaysia, we don't have um, uh, legislation to support lasting powers of attorney. So if you're in that veggie state, good luck to you. Yeah. So, I'm, so with the little that we have in our hands, when I think of structuring, I'm going from wills to trusts. Um, I start um, onshore, I think of doing wills for my clients, and then if they want something higher, they, we have a trust element in the will. Then we go offshore, is uh, offshore trust, you know, is, it, is the assets worth spending that money going on an offshore trust? And then when you're thinking of going offshore, you can consider foundations too. And the flexibility of what the offshore world is allowing in the laws, I feel they can even curtail issues of estate duty. And I like to think that we are, um, we can be a little bit uh, creative in our drafting. I was trying to see where we can 
put into a scenario where we don't have lasting power attorney laws and whether foundations, when their purposes of all medical matters, whether we can actually uh, help there. It's just a thought. An international structure like a foundation can easily also hold cross-border as assets and the beneficiaries concerned on whatever nationality can receive through properly planned channels. So I would surmise, EPIC, I like acronyms. Okay, we need to plan and structure. There is a great number of crazy rich Asians here. There's wealth and assets to deal with. But these crazy rich Asians, they are aging. So they look, have to look for successes. Should estate duty come back into play, it's prudent to plan beyond the will. And of course, my little worry what issues are the fact of you know, living wills and lasting power, attorney, lasting power attorney. I would canvas that those who have not looked into the foundation structure to look a little bit closer, because um, in my experience and the families I've assisted, um, it's worked. It's really worked. And they're happy with the fact that they feel that they're doing something they are planning, they are having a structure, but they don't feel as if they are letting go entirely. So the Labuan Foundations Act came into force in the year 2010. Labuan is now marketing the Labuan uh, the foundation um, for eight years now, but it has been tenacious in selling this product because, as I mentioned, in this region, Singapore and Hong Kong doesn't have it, so you know Labuan's doing good that way. Um, and after my explanation above. Um, and all that, I hope you all got the gist that the foundation is really an easy fit. Um, I'm just a legal practitioner like the rest of yourselves. Admittedly, you have to inhale the offshore uh, statutes, but after you do, um, it has been a pleasure helping the clients and the family concern. And I have to also tell you that um, I do basic um, onshore work here where we do SMPs, loans, whatever. Um, structuring work for good, well, I don't even have to say good, most of them are good, because we, when you do all this planning with the um, individuals, the patriarch matrix, or the family, this kind of work is hefty. You definitely form, form, a, bond, uh, form a bond with them, and it's very, very gratifying. So, um, reiterating cake and all, um, that's the end of it. Go have cake a bit after this, all right? Thank you very much. I hope that was something, all right?